You're listening to the 300s Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the 300s Podcast. This is episode 8. Thanks for tuning in. We're here with Big Z once again. How, how's it going over there? Doing all right. Glad to be with you again. Long time no speak. I know. I feel like it's been too long. I feel like we've all kind of gotten into uh, the summer a little bit early. So I want to get back on track. Glad to have you back on the podcast. Yeah, we got to get back on track. Training camp starts soon. I know. I know. We got we got so much going on with the Celtics offseason. We got the Red Sox up and down. Obviously, we got the Patriots who look like they're going to go for the jugular this year. So let's get back on track. Let's get more into a uh, weekly thing. Definitely. Sounds good. All right. So it's the dead of summer. There's only a few topics to really discuss, but... But man, these few topics are hot right now. We got Trader Danny in the Celtics offseason, and of course, we got the dog days of baseball. So let's get it. Crank this motherfucker up. All right, so Celtics. Celtics signed Gordon Hayward to a max deal. This is something that, you know, it's kind of been rumored for a long time. Obviously, uh, with Brad Stevens, he was, he was uh, Gordon Hayward's coach at Butler. So they had that relationship going back years and years. But, you know, it, you never know. Even if you, people rumored, yeah, it's a done deal. Until they actually sign the contract, you never know. And you know the Celtics have gotten screwed on deals like that in the past. So, what, what are you? What were your thoughts on that? Were you surprised that they actually landed another big free agent like Gordon Hayward? Yeah, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, again, like you said, it was something that everyone had been expecting. But then it gets to that point, you never know what the hell is going to happen. I was sitting on a patio on July fourth, refreshing Twitter every two minutes just to see what the latest update is. You know, is he going? Is he not? They said he was going, and then he said it's not official yet. They were waiting to release something on the Players' Tribune. So, yeah, I mean, I think whenever you land a big free agent, even if it's semi-expected, you're still a little bit surprised. You know, an example in another sport, when the Red Sox signed David Price or they land a trade for Chris Seal, even though you know it's something that's in the realm of possibility, maybe even likely, it always is surprising. And, you know, it feels real good to see your team get that big fish finally. Yeah, and you know it's that time of year where you turn on your your uh, Adrian Wojnarowski notifications, just waiting for that next Woj bomb. And the day when they signed him, it was kind of a it was a cluster. It was a lot of confusion going on. The Celtics signed him, they didn't sign him. Oh, actually, he hasn't made his decision yet. The agents coming out saying we're not sure yet. And obviously, it ended up being a lot of bullshit. But as a Celtics fan, you're you're sitting there going, hold on, is he signed? Is he not? Are, are we about to bite one here? Yeah, I mean. NBA free agency usually isn't this convoluted. I remember LeBron James and the decision how many years ago. Boom, I'm going to Miami. No ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah, but I got to say, NBA offseason kicks the shit out of every other offseason. And same thing with the trade deadline. Like, what other sport can you say big moves like this, big trades, big big new acquisitions happen consistently? Like, you're watching the NBA offseason. You're seeing, uh, you know, Paul George moving. You're seeing, obviously, last, last year, Kevin Durant moving. You're seeing Chris Paul move. You got Gordon Hayward coming to the Celtics, so it's all these different moves. Where in the NFL, you know, the no fun league, you got uh, they used to call the NBA the No Balls Association. I know Bill Simmons <laughs> used to say that, but it feels like the last few years, maybe it's because the salary cap's growing, and maybe it's also a, a direct reaction to Golden State being so good. Where these teams say we have to make a move, either we're not going to be good for ten years, or we have to jump on it right now, which I think is what Houston's doing. I mean, we we have the beard, we have one of the best players in the league. We might as well jump on it now. If we don't, you know, we're going to waste the prime of another player. I think you're absolutely right with that Golden State thing. Everybody is building in relation to Golden State. And even teams like the Minnesota Timberwolves say, hey, we got to do something. The Timberwolves haven't made the playoffs in 13 years. It is hard to believe that an NBA team wouldn't at least make the playoffs once by accident in 13 years. I mean, that's a franchise that's been down and out. Even they said, you know what, we got to do something. You can't just punt every year so you do start to see some teams make some moves yeah i don't want to get too much on timberwolves talk but i know we were talking about them recently and uh, i don't know what they were doing the past you know decade but they after kg they had shitty draft pick after shitty draft pick you know they were drafting what ricky rubio and they're drafting uh what was the flynn kid they were drafting so many bums it really seems only the last two three years when they really started making smart moves they definitely they definitely definitely look like a team that's it's on the rise of building right they got wiggins so they're, they're actually yeah. going to be exciting to watch. And, you know, that's a lot of teams. They'll tank for a while, and then they never get the next LeBron, the next Durant, and you can't tank for a decade on end. So at some point you have to say, all right, we're going to be the Washington Bullets for a couple of years. We're not going to win a championship, but I'd at least rather host two playoff games a year and get my ass kicked than finish 25 and 50 every year. Well, that's what drives me nuts about 
a lot of the Boston media. You know, They'd rather the team go 25 and 50 to build to beat Golden State than actually try. Yeah. I don't exactly. know if this is just me. If you're a team and you lose in the finals, yeah, that sucks. At least you got there. That is my personal philosophy as a fan. Thankfully, I haven't had to see the Red Sox lose in a World Series, but seeing the Pats lose in a Super Bowl and seeing the Bruins lose in the Stanley Cup final, you know what? At least if you get there, you know, you can't really give a team a hard time about losing in the championship game because, as we've seen with the New York Giants, anything could happen in the final. Yeah, and the thing with the Celtics is they're in such a unique position that they can build for now, and they still have all those draft picks because the Nets made that stupid trade years ago that they can build for the future. So that's why they're able to sign guys like Al Horford and Gordon Hayward and be in talks for guys like, like Paul George and try and win now, even if it's not necessarily uh, completely reasonable just because of teams like Golden State. But you never know. But they don't have to do that at the sacrifice of building for later, which is what I, I think people seem to forget. It's like going after, you know, you know assuming you're not trading the, the Brooklyn picks and things like that in the future, if you can add on free agents and not destroy your cap space and you can you can – uh, trade for guys like Paul George with some shitty picks like your own pick and the Sacramento pick. You can build for now and go for a, go at a run and try and win and have a good team and you know also have your draft picks who are top three draft picks two years in a row going to be three years in a row next year if they don't trade that. You have those guys growing up in a winning environment. You have 19, 20 year olds that are going to be studs playing in Eastern Conference Finals year after year. You think that's that's worse than? Paul Pierce when he's 22 playing for an absolute basement team like come on like there's there's literally no downside to going for it now assuming you don't uh bargain the future yeah I agree with you completely and you mentioned that thing about bringing in key free agents the Celtics for the first time in our lives they're able to do it I mean before last year who was their biggest free agent Dominic Wilkins 20 something years ago so well so that's 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 the amazing thing like Danny Ainge, you, you, I know people love to shit on him. Some people say he's he's God. It's kind of you know one side or the other, but you can't you can't deny that second year in a row Danny has brought in a top free agent. That's two out of the three biggest free agents in the last two off season. Obviously not counting Durant, which they were in on kind of, but the fact that the Seas have been able to bring in these two big max free agents after never really signing any top free agent in our lifetimes, you got to give the guy credit for that. Yeah, I don't know how much you make out of the Brad Stevens connection with Gordon Hayward. I know that he played two years under Stevens in college, but, you know, I remember when I was in college, I lived with guys in college. I run into them on the street now. I don't even say hello. This guy, seven years later, still wants to win a title with this guy? See, All I, right. I disagree. I think I think it was huge. I think it was probably the biggest reason because, I mean, you also hear rumblings that uh, he didn't necessarily want to be the guy in Utah, but... Um, I think going back to Brad Stevens, this was his guy. This is the guy that brought him from some no-name, you know, 18-year-old with a bowl cut to a first-round draft pick in the NBA. And whether that was all Stevens or, or, or no, no help from Stevens at all, Gordon Hayward, you know, he has that relationship with him. This guy helped me get there. He helped use me the best way possible. And now you got a lot of people in Utah saying, like, oh, the coach we have is great. And, yeah, he might be. I mean, Brad's a great young coach who, is he amazing X's and O's? I don't actually know. I mean, I'm not I'm not an NBA scout, but I think Gordon Hayward had that perception of this is a great relationship. I think I can go with this guy, and he can take me to the next level. And then also, you're going to the East, where he could be all NBA. You know, it's it's a lot easier to to make the playoffs, make the conference finals, be an All Star year in year out. So that's another big uh, factor in it. Yeah, it's unbelievable that more guys don't come East. I know. If Hayward had stayed in Utah, there might have been, or there would have been some more money there. But if you've got those competitive juices flowing and you want to make a run for it, why wouldn't you go east? Is everyone so drawn to LA that they don't care? Yeah, that's the thing I don't get. Speaking of LA, let's pivot to that. Two points. I mean, one, you got all the rumors saying LeBron's a done deal to go to LA. The thing I don't get is I get LA. He's been in movies. He's in that that shitty movie with uh, Amy Schumer that I never saw. But he's gonna leave Cleveland, beautiful, sunny Cleveland that's winning 60 games a year to go play in Los Angeles for a lottery team when he's, he's going to be, what, 33, 34? Why would he leave a great situation like Cleveland where they're almost a lock to make the NBA Finals year in, year out, to go fight through all the great teams in the West? I mean, you got the Spurs, you got the Thunder, you got obviously the Warriors. Why is he going to do that at 34? I just don't see that happening. Yeah, and what's funny, you mentioned that great situation in Cleveland. 
it seems like it's starting to crumble, and it's all of his doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cleveland is just, I think I think you're dead on. I think with David Griffin, it was just year after year of, all right, we're going to make this trade. We're going to make this signing. We're going to blow up all our assets for the future just so we can please LeBron. And I think it got to the point this year where, again, with the rumors of him leaving, I don't think those came out of nowhere. You got all those rumors of him leaving saying, all right, we'll trade for Carmelo. All right, trade for Paul George. Do this, do that. And Dave Griffin probably said, are you fucking kidding me? Or if, if I'm going to do these moves, you need to commit to three years. Otherwise, if you leave next year, I'm left holding a bag. It's just so unreal in the NBA how if you're at the top and you slip and you fall down, you fall down for 15 years. The Detroit Pistons won championship in 2004. And I know the Celtics got by him in 2008 in the Eastern Conference Finals. But really, again, the Pistons, they win in 2004. Haven't heard much of them since, at least in baseball. If you're the Yankees and you have a down year, you can be back up the next year. Hell, the Kansas City Royals sucked for a decade and they made magical improvements in 2015. So it's just almost unfair how the NBA, if you get near the top and you stutter or you falter, you're done for a dozen years. Yeah, which is why, again, Danny Ainge is always going to get the benefit of the doubt from me. I mean, the guy has really just been masterful in the way he's built the team. And, you know, a lot of that you can say is because of the Nets making that stupid trade. But, you know, Danny was the one that made that trade. He got those draft picks, afforded him that luxury to take his time. So he doesn't have to make the move to go all in for a guy like Jimmy Butler. He can draft guys like Jalen Brown and, and Tatum and, and kind of go with that while he's also building with through free agency. So if you don't have a LeBron James, you have a very slim chance. I mean, Golden State's the anomaly. The reason Golden State is so good, obviously they got Kevin Durant, which made them unbeatable, but the year before that, they won 73 games, and they did it through the draft. They're an anomaly. Well, when was Curry drafted? When was Curry drafted? Was it 2008? I think he was 2010. 2010? That team did not get good overnight. Curry is not a 22-year-old player anymore. It took him a while to become the player that he is. There aren't many guys that come out like Durant or LeBron. No, exactly. I mean, Steph Curry, he was... And so you're right. They are the anomaly. Yeah, the anomaly. I mean, granted, they... They drafted phenomenally, and I, I think that a lot has, has to do with that with Jerry West, who just went to the Clippers. But they drafted Steph Curry, they drafted Draymond Green in the second round, they drafted Clay Thompson, and then they built you know great pieces to fit around them. And then that allowed them to bring in a guy like Kevin Durant, plus the salary cap going up, which was another anomaly, which is why they're an all-time team. But with Golden State, uh, they were talking about ESPN recently, their their luxury tax and their their actual salaries over the years as it goes. I think it was 2000. 20 i want to say if they keep everyone at the current salary and the current luxury tax they'll be paying 400 million dollars for the <laughs> team so that team's not going to last so it, it, there's no reason in punting on the next decade they're not going to be around forever even george steinbrenner would blush at that number yeah exactly you can't be making that much money in oakland so i mean they might win the next three but you might as well be in it and then be ready to win when Jalen brown and jason tatum are 22 you know yeah exactly so again going back to la though I don't know if you saw the story today, but now Paul George is coming out and saying he might not sign with the Lakers, where, again, kind of similar to LeBron, it kind of seemed like, at least from what it was reported, it was going to be a done deal. And this might just be him playing politics. He doesn't want to burn bridges in Oklahoma City before he even gets into town. But if OKC goes on a run and they play well and Paul George ends up staying there and not signing with L.A., doesn't this make Danny Ainge look like an asshole? Like, I know one of the main reasons he didn't want to sign, he didn't want to trade for him was because he didn't want to risk him leaving for LA in a year but if it comes out he he wasn't going to go anyways and you could have got him for you know pennies on the dollar isn't that that a bad look for Danny yeah I think it is and personally if it were me I can understand the hesitation to trade for a guy who says he's out in a year but I would worry about that later I'm the type of guy I'll future me I don't know you that's somebody else's problem you know give me a year to do some work maybe I can talk you into it I mean he had to do a lot of work to get Garnett and Ray Allen on the program. So, again, it doesn't look like Danny's opposed to trying to put in the work, put in the effort in that relationship. You know, I'm more on the side. I would trade for the guy and deal with that later. But, you know, who knows? But I I think it is politics. And you mentioned why NBA NBA free agency is so great. All these guys are moving around. That's because the players run the league. Yeah, it's insane compared to any other sport. I mean, if you're a football player, and, again, they were coming out saying – Oh, look at the contracts NBA players are getting. Like, you're also a millionaire. Cry me a fucking river. But, you know, if you're an NFL player without guaranteed contracts and you're looking around at baseball and basketball and these guys are getting $230 million guaranteed deals and you're playing on a, essentially a one-year deal every year, I get it. 
But overall, the Celtics are in good shape. Jalen Brown looked really good towards the end of last year. He looks good in the playoffs. I like him. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, Jason Tatum looks great thus far in Summer League. And again, it's Summer League. I'm not going to get too excited about it. But if you just avoid, don't look at the stats. Just look at him play. The guy's got post moves. The guy's got turnaround jumpers. The guy looks like an NBA player. And I'm, I'm excited to watch him play. And not to mention, they still have two potential top five picks next year. I mean, in theory, you could have the one and two pick next year, which is insane. The way it worked out this year, I never thought I'd see the Celtics get the number one pick. So why the hell not? Get number one and number two, and he could do a Belichick and trade him for, you know, 18, 22, 24, 30. Uh, Belichick. What is it with these guys and these draft picks? I don't know. All right, so uh, moving on. One of the new segments that we're going to be doing more of are the 300s ballpark reviews. You know, what better time to really start that than this week with Miami's Marlins Park. Now, I know you were there recently over the summer, right? Or maybe it was in spring. Give us a breakdown, you know, what what you thought of it. Is it outrageous? Is it nice? What was it? It was strange. It was last August, and walking up to that, it's not like anything I'd ever seen before. I didn't expect Wrigley or Fenway in South Florida, but this felt like I was walking into the future. It didn't even really look like a ballpark from the outside. It looked more like a football stadium or basketball stadium. And then when you walk in, again, it's unlike anything I'd ever seen before. You've got bright floors, walls, well-lit, none of that bare concrete you see at all these older stadiums. Um, Yeah, it almost felt like I was walking into the future. It almost felt like I was walking into a different country. That ballpark is located in Little Havana. So it's definitely a different feel than you're used to at some of the ballparks in the Northeast or even on the West Coast. And, you know, you can certainly see it in there. You've got a lot of Cuban food options. The food menus are flipping back and forth from English to Spanish. So just a very different feel in South Florida. Yeah, I think you said it. There's not a lot of, like, gray concrete kind of uh, concourse. And obviously, if you look in center field, you know, you see that, uh, I think someone described it recently as, uh, you know, a flamingo mural on acid. Is the <laughs> is the, the concourse full of that too? Is it like is it like Miami Vice down there? It kind of is, and that center field piece of artwork, we'll call it. You know, I look at that. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, so is Miami, who's paying it for paying for it for the next what 35 years. Yeah, these ballpark deals. If I were a governor, I don't know what I'd do because these teams kind of have a gun to your head. But if I could make a constitutional amendment to ban funding taxpayer stadiums, I would do it. Yeah, and I, th- I think we've had this conversation in the past where, you know, living in Boston, it's a lot different than living in Milwaukee. Living in Boston, they say, oh, we want you to pay for a stadium. We say, go piss up a rope. You're not going to leave Boston. So we yeah, definitely I, have a lot more leverage. I think there was some concern that the Patriots might leave at one point, but really not. And then you're right. The Boston Bruins aren't leaving. The Boston Bruins aren't the Hartford Whalers. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, you're in a city like Milwaukee or yeah, if you're a city in Miami with a baseball team that's playing its game outdoors and just wilting in the heat every year. Yeah, I could definitely see and be seen as the mayor or the governor that didn't want to lose that team or the Minnesota Twins. The Minnesota Twins weren't even threatening to leave. The owners were threatening to sell the team back to Major League Baseball so they could fold up shop. Get my money back. But, um, with Mar- but yeah, it, it was a different type of ballpark, and it wasn't a bad ballpark. It was very nice, minus the cockroach I almost stepped on. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a different feeling. It almost felt like a basketball arena. And then the retractable roof was closed because it was 100 million degrees in Miami in August. But you know, it felt like you're inside. It felt like a dome. Is there really a nightclub in left field? I, I know that, I don't know if that was a rumor or if that was a real thing, but it sounded very Miami. There is, I believe it's called the Clevelander, and I chose not to go anywhere near that because I just, I couldn't process being told to take off my baseball hat going into a club <laughs> in a friggin' ballpark. I just made made the decision, nope, I am not going to deal with that nonsense. I mean, I can I can uh, sympathize. I mean, if I'm in college or, you know, I'm a big dancer, you're going out, it's probably cheaper to get into Mar- Marlins Park and then go into the club than go to a regular nightclub. And then the beers are probably the same price. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, million-dollar question, though. Did you meet Marlon's man? He was sick last August. Ah, oh, piece of shit. And, and, I, and I'm still sick about it. I'm going to hunt him down one of these days. <laughs> and, mean- you know, with Marlon's man, he's actually pretty good. I see him retweeting photos with all sorts of random people. I'm a random person. I'll take a photo with him. He seems like kind of an okay guy. So, you know, I'm going to hunt him down at some point. But, yeah, I was pretty disappointed to see that he was sick. I was 
following him on Twitter that week to see if I might be able to locate him, but no dice. All right, that's your white whale. I need you to track him down when you're traveling next ballpark. Maybe if you go back to Miami. we got to get a picture with Marlins, man. We're on it. Put it on the bucket list. All right, now, other parks we want to do, what's coming up? I know Fenway we could do later. We, you know, Everyone's been to Fenway. We don't have to you know, be groundbreaking there. I think you're going to another park soon, right? Miller Park is next on my docket, so that'll probably be my next review. All right, great. Yeah, I know we've been there. Phenomenal brats, so we're going to expect a lot of content out of Milwaukee. And one thing I'll touch on about Fenway, you mentioned everyone's been to Fenway. We don't get to review Fenway. I, I agree with that. But going to more ballparks definitely gives you more of an appreciation for Fenway. Certainly they've done a lot of upgrades and improvements over the last 15 years. But again, going around the league, I mean, I've even been to Camden Yards and I go, what the hell is this? There's lights going off everywhere. There's videos playing on the, out, the outfield walls. There's sounds going off. No, I just want to watch a baseball game. And Fenway is kind of the last place where they actually pay attention to the game. Yeah, and it's definitely... They don't have to enforce no getting up or back to your seat in between pitches because nobody does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's definitely one of those places where, and we talk a lot about how it was always great, but over the last 10, 15 years, the changes they've made have made it even better. Like, it's easy for me to say I'm, you know, 5'8". If you're 6'4", you, you don't want to go to the game because sitting in those seats is going to suck because people in 1918 weren't 6'4". They just didn't exist. Have you um, ever been to a game with a couple of your friends who were a little bit bigger than you? Because I have a couple of buddies that are over six feet. You go to, a, I go to a game with them, and it's, I can't move. I can't double fist beers because you know both my elbows are in my stomach. Yeah, I go, I go to games with buddies that are tall, and they get to sit sideways, and I just, I just sit there and laugh. I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Now you know how it sucks. <laughs> but, hey, one, one for the short guys every once in a while, right? Yeah. So speaking of Marlins Park, I know we got the All Star game this week. Uh, this is going to be up after the game already happened, so we'll see. Hopefully, you know, Chris Sale doesn't take one off the dome. Um, but last night was the home run derby and watch, I don't normally watch it. I mean, it's just one of those things where, uh, it was on last night. There's two Yankees in it. My girlfriend's a Yankees fan. So we watched it and I got to tell you, Aaron judge is a freak of nature and it, it's not really a surprise. I mean, unless you've been living under a rock, you know, he's incredible. He's had 30 home runs already. He already broke the Yankees record for home runs by a rookie. He's well on his way to breaking the MLB record by Mark McGuire for home runs by a rookie. But just watching the guy literally just take swing after swing and hitting these 400, 500 foot moon shots, it put the fear of God into me because it just gave me a glimpse into the next decade of pain for Red Sox fans. This guy's going to be hitting moon shots onto, onto Lansdowne, onto the pike. He, I mean, I think he legitimately might kill someone sitting in the front row in the monster seats. I'm not kidding. Yeah, you mentioned that he's built like Gronk. Hey, I get nothing against the guy. Of course, I'm a Red Sox fan. I don't want to see him punish the Red Sox for the next 10 years. But what do we know about Gronk? Guys that size, they tend to break down. So, let you know, again, I think he's going to be a good player for a long time, but I'm not ready to put him into Cooperstown just yet. Yeah, because even before this year, he was, uh, I mean, he was hit or miss. He was batting under 200. He was, you know, striking out like a, like a ton. Like, the way I was thinking of him was he's like a white Willie Mopena. Three true outcomes. <laughs> And now he is mashing the shit out of the ball on pace for 60 home runs. So that should be fun for the next decade. Yeah, and, you know, the Yankees haven't really had a guy like this in a while. Definitely not homegrown. So, I mean, even when they had their good teams, Jeter was a very good player. He was not some guy that was just crushing it. Um, yeah, I mean, Posada didn't crush home runs. The biggest they didn't really have homegrown guys like this. They are just good teams. Yeah, the biggest matches I can think of are probably Giambi and Sheffield and A-Rod and even Teixeira for a little bit, but obviously none of them are homegrown. Yeah, guys they brought in. So, speaking of the Red Sox, speaking of the All-Star game, Chris Sale gets the start tonight in the All-Star game, and this guy just continues his dominant 2017. And the guy has been great, but I think people really are underrating just how good he's been. I mean, you know, this is his second All-Star game start in a row. I guess he's the first player to ever get back-to-back All-Star game starts for different teams. And he also set the Red Sox record for most 10-game, 10, 10-strikeout 10 games in a season, uh, in the, in the or I should say in the first half of a season. So the guy has just been unbelievable, and he's well on his way to a Cy Young. Yeah, you would have to think so. And you mentioned not many guys starting the All-Star game in consecutive years for different teams because, yeah, it's hard to figure how you'd let a guy like this go. I don't care what the King's ransom was, you know, 
a guy like this, you got to pull the trigger. And I almost feel bad for Chris Sale because he was so high build. He's living up to it to a T. And he's certainly getting credit, but I think you're right. I don't think people realize how remarkable he is because he was billed as being the guy, and he has been the guy. So the guy that lives up to expectations doesn't really get the credit that he deserves. It's tough to say that, but yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, because it's it's one of those things where, you know, the guy, it's like you're expecting so much. He comes in, he surpasses it. He does even better than you expect, you know, compared to someone like, like David Price, who you have all these expectations for he comes in and he's a big soft puss and it's not really what you're expecting. But I think it doesn't help that Nesson ratings are down. I don't know if you've heard they're down, I think like 20% compared to last year. But just looking at the guy's numbers, Chris sale in the first half among AL starters, he's top three in war ERA wins whip innings pitched. And he leads all AL pitchers in K's by more than 30. He has 178 strikeouts, which is 30 strikeouts more than the guy in second. It would have been a slight against God to not give the guy the start. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I could think of is if he had started Sunday or he was starting Friday, something like that. Thankfully, it worked out because, you know, knock on wood, nobody gets hurt in the All-Star game. He's going to throw a couple of cookies for an inning or two. It's not for a home field advantage anymore. So, you know, maybe maybe he'll just throw one inning like they used to back before 2003. So a well-deserved honor. Yeah, I can't imagine I'm pitching too much. But, again, the guy is on pace for, I think it's 356 Ks, which would be the most strikeouts in a single season since Randy Johnson. He had, I think, 372 in 01. You know, he he won the Cy Young that year, the second of his three in a row. But I was looking into it because I wrote a post about it the other day. Here's the list of pitchers that have had 300 strikeouts in a season over the past 20 years. Clayton Kershaw, 2015. Randy Johnson, 99, 2000, 2001, and 2002. So he did four years in a row. Pedro Martinez in 99, and Kurt Schilling in 97 and 98. That's it. Four guys in 20 years. So that's pretty good company to have. So people need to really start paying attention to Chris Sale. Uh, a soon-to-be Hall of Famer, maybe. Two Hall of Famers, and one should-be Hall of Famer. It's insane. I mean, the Red Sox might get back-to-back Cy Young winners. And, you know, Porcello won it last year. I don't know what happened to him this year, but... That would be that would be an incredible accomplishment. I don't know when the last time that happened. I mean, I know Kurt Schilling never won the Cy Young, but he was always runner up to to Randy when they were playing on the Diamondbacks. He was runner up to Johan Santana his first year in Boston. So, um, yeah, Kurt Schilling. You know, not to get off on a tangent, but great player. But there was always somebody just a little bit better than him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think we're in agreement. He should be in the Hall of Fame because. Even if you look at the stats, oh, he never won, or I don't think he ever won a Cy Young. But right? he says mean things on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's definitely. You gotta put everything together, and you know, who knows? He's definitely nuts. But of all the Cy Youngs he didn't win, he came in second to his teammate Randy Johnson, who had all-time seasons like four years in a row. He lost to Johan Santana, who was an all-time grade for a stretch. So it's not like he was coming in seventh; like he was coming in second to some of the greatest pitching seasons of all time. And we're talking about the Red Sox pitching. I mean, even if they get average performances out of the other guys or slightly above average performances, if Chris Sale keeps up on his pace, you know, they're still going to win over 90 games. And so you have to feel pretty good about this Red Sox team. I know it it looks shaky just giving it the eyeball test, but you think about it logically, you go, again, if they can just, if all the other guys can keep pulling their weight and Chris Sale keeps up what he's doing, they're going to be fine. And David Price... As much as it irks me that he gets in beef with the media and then doesn't back it up, he picks fights with Ellen, Evan Drellick and then gets his ass kicked. He is off to a better start through nine games this year than he was last year. And despite not looking like the guy the Red Sox thought they were signing, he's kind of been all right. Yeah, he actually hasn't been bad. I know it's uh, something that Carabas talks about a lot. You take out a, a few starts in the beginning, a few starts at the, at the end last year, and he had a pretty good year. And then same thing with this year. If you take out the uh, whole Evan Drellick weekend and that, that one shit bomb of a Yankees start, he's got an ERA in the late, low three. So he's been pretty good. I think it's just he's you know he's quiet. He's unassuming. He's not blowing guys away. He was hurt for a long time. And then he's just been kind of an asshole. So I, I think he just hasn't really ingratiated himself with the, with the fans that much. But the problem with Price is, and I also feel the same way about Pomerantz, who's a lot cheaper, but 
I feel like these guys are hanging on by a thread. And it would not surprise me in the least if they, you know, either blew their elbow out or they just went on a, on an absolute, you know, they just imploded down the stretch and, you know, had six ERA. So I don't yeah, really know. Yeah, for a team in first place by a couple of games, it feels weird to think that it's being held together by duct tape and nails, but it does kind of feel that way. Yeah, because I mean, it's always one of those things where, say they go on and they win the World Series, we'll look back and be like, Price had a 3.2 ERA. What the hell was everyone freaking out about? But, you know, now in the moment, he just looks like a guy who's unhinged, who looks like he can't handle the media or the pressure. And despite pitching well, he's prone to these absolute blowups, which a guy who's making $30 million a year shouldn't be giving up seven runs on, on odd outings. Would you take that, though, if he has five great outings in a row and then just takes an ass-kicking every six starters? So, you know, obviously you'd rather see six good starts in a row than five excellent and one shitty. But, you know, would you almost take it? All right, he's going to get his ass kicked once a month, but the other four or five starts are going to be pretty good. Do you almost take the good with the bad because you're not going to win every time out anyways? Well, so here's the thing. If that was, like, in a vacuum, I would definitely take that. If he's going to if he's gonna pitch four great starts and get one shitty start, that's totally fine, as long as it's not in the playoffs. The problem with Price is I don't think he has the mental fortitude or the, the ability to buckle down and say, hey, it's October. I can't fuck around today. I have to go out, throw seven scoreless, can't give up more than one run. I don't think he has that. I think he comes in, he goes, oh, I'm not having a great day. I'm going to have a bad day today. I don't think he has the mental mental fortitude to turn around. Yeah, if the Red Sox do make the playoffs, I don't think they should take him out of the rotation. I think he should get a start. No. You know, it'll be game it'll be game two or game three. But I just hope manager John, you know, John Wayne has the stones to say, all right, if the ship's going down, I'm pulling the plug. Like, I don't want him getting pulled in the fourth inning when he's given up seven. If this thing is teetering and he's down 3 nothing in the second, pull the plug then. Yeah, no, I would not. I would absolutely not skip him. I think he's too good of a player to skip. But I think he's also a mental case, and I think he's prone to implosions. So you should definitely be ready to pull him. I mean, if you want to have Erod or whoever in the bullpen ready to go in the playoffs, I think, I think in John Farrell's office there should be a picture of Grady Little patting Pedro on the shoulder, and then next to that should be a picture of Grady Little getting fired. Just a clock ticking. Just remember, you can take the guy out. If you fuck it up, though, you're going to get fired. All right. I mean, I think that was all the topics I had to cover. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to jump into before we get out of here. No, I think we covered all the bases. Good time to be coming back. Like I said, training camp starting soon, so we got to get our chops ready too. I know we got fantasy football coming up. We got the Patriots coming up. They they look like world beaters. I'm excited for it. Maybe some fantasy WNBA. I hear fantasy WNBA is going to happen. Uh, I started the league. I know you joined in it. We're gonna have a lot of content out of that. I'm going to have so much action on DraftKings WNBA. It's gonna be it's gonna be not even gonna be funny. Can I still get Rebecca Lobo? I I, I, I mean, did she still play? <laughs> I think I know Brittany Griner. We used to actually have a uh, WNBA life-size cutout of uh, Diana Taurasi in our college dorm room. It was fucking massive. That, that's a name. I know who she is. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening to uh, the 300s podcast. We'll see you guys next time.